There are a lot of biosocial theories out there, um, so I just want to talk about a couple of them. Um, it's sort of these are some of the better known, I guess, um, within criminology. Uh, if you haven't sort of checked out the other um, videos about um, sort of the foundations of trait theory and, and sort of a little bit more about biosocial theory, um, definitely go check those ones out. But <clears throat> I just sort of want to talk about how we can apply the idea of sort of the biosocial approach in a couple of different specific ways. So the first thing we're going to talk about is arousal theory. So um, <clears throat> people have different responses uh, to environmental stimuli. So in general, everybody wants the right amount of environmental stimulus. So we like to have enough that we're not bored. So if we have too little, then we're bored. But if we have too much, then we're stressed and anxious. So we all kind of want that nice, middle, happy medium where we are not bored, but also not stressed. And so arousal theory talks about how this, these different levels of arousal then leads to some people having high versus low arousal patterns. So some people are easily aroused, and so they're content with very little excitement in their lives. Um, while other people need a lot more stimuli uh, to be to sort of reach that happy medium and that leads to things like thrill seeking and dangerous potentially criminal behavior so it's <clears throat> while we all want that happy medium what that happy medium is to everybody is different and that's sort of the key to arousal theory is that there are different levels of what's considered our happy medium for everybody everybody has a different happy place uh, where we have just the right amount of stimuli. And um, <clears throat> so there, that means that the people that are, um, that sort of have these very um, low sort of need for arousal, then they're going to be, they're, they might be the people that you kind of think of as, oh, they're kind of boring. Like they never want to do anything. They always just stay at home or, um, you know, something like that. That would be because they don't require a lot of arousal to be happy versus our risk takers and oh they're like the crazy ones they always want to be doing like like stunts on their bikes or you know cliff jumping or um, whatever else and so it's because they require those high levels of arousal to be in their happy place and so every it's like a continuum and so everybody falls somewhere along this continuum of where their happy place is and so there are a lot of factors that kind of go into the the potential reasoning for um, these different arousal patterns um, proposed to be both due to ge both genetic and um, environmental factors. So brain chemistry, um, you could have um, brains that have more neurotransmitter receptor sites, then that means it takes more to get the same level of arousal. So the more of those receptor sites that you have, which is these, this is kind of what it looks like this is a dopamine receptor. So if you have more of those dopamine receptors, then that means that you need more excitement to fill them all. So that would be the more you have, the more excitement you need. Um, also heart rate has been shown to be related here because uh, low heart rate means that you need more excitement to get to that normal level. Um, so sometimes resting heart rate can be an indicator. Um, also the automatic, autonomic nervous system. Uh, if, if you have exaggerated skin, skin conductivity, then that relates to overreacting to like a mild provocation or a slight um, from somebody and and so that ANS might be connected to you know people who like seem to fly off the handle at nothing uh, or overreact to situations it might have to do with their ANS um, <clears throat> and so if we look at something like dopamine receptors serotonin receptors um, so for dopamine actually if you have too much dopamine then that is what is what leads to it can cause like psychosis and general irrationality um, drugs increase your level of dopamine, uh, creating that high. And if you don't have enough dopamine, then you chase that high to make yourself feel more happy, either through things like drug use or other thrill seeking behavior that can sort of connect to this arousal theory. So the idea is that we all want to feel happy, but not overstimulated. And so that's sort of the crux of arousal theory. <clears throat> then we can look at genetics. There's been a lot of research looking at sort of how genes affect criminality, some more helpful than others uh, in terms of research. Antisocial behavior, though, might be linked to genes. So, um, so this is sort of taking a molecular biology approach and looking at those that connection specifically to genes. But 
maybe that's direct, but it's much more likely that it's indirect. Um, um, so the direct link would mean that if you have a specific gene or genetic makeup, then that makes you more prone to aggression or violence or any social behavior in general. And remember, keep in mind that any social behavior doesn't mean that you don't make friends. Antisocial behavior in, in, in the criminology context means that you don't follow rules. So these are the people that are breaking rules, including laws. So keep that in mind. Um, but anyway, so if you have that direct link through your genetics, that means that, oh, this specific gene or genetic makeup makes increase that proneness um, to aggression or violence or impulsivity or what have you. The indirect link is if you have a specific gene or genetic makeup, then that makes you more likely to have certain traits. And it is those traits that are then related to antisociality and deviance. So things like psychopathy, impulsivity, neuroticism, um, anxiety, obsession, compulsion, things like that, that it's that indirect link. It's linked through traits that are then have a certain linkage um, to criminality. Um, <clears throat> it, there are different ways that people have tried to test genetic theory, one being through parental criminality and deviance. So, um, you know, if you compare the children of criminals or deviants, they are more likely to be delinquent themselves. This, of course, begs the question, is it a genetic link or is it learning? And so, you know, you grow up with criminal parents, you're going, they're going to teach you that criminality is okay in terms of your moral justification, as well as you'll see them do it. It'll, it, it be, so there is, there, there's obviously more to it than that, but if there is a genetic link, then it, it would be supported by the idea that parental criminality is related to the criminality of the child. Um, then there's been research looking at siblings. Um, research shows that if one sibling engages in any social behavior, brothers and sisters are also more likely to. Um, again, that could be an environmental thing because if they're growing up in the same environment, then we can't tease apart the genetic linkage versus the environmental linkage. So then enter twin studies, which is sort of the a more clear way to compare the effects of genes versus environment. Um, especially if we look at um, the difference between monozygotic versus dizygotic twins. So monozygotic being our identical twins, which they would have the exact same DNA versus our dizygotic, which would have no more DNA in common except compared to siblings. Um, they would have the same amount of DNA in common, but obviously they have then the same, um, you know, the same, they grew in the same uterus. And so there, any interuterine effects would be the same. Um, <clears throat> but then... So the earliest studies conducted on um, looking at the behavior of twins, they did find a significant relationship between criminal activities of monozygotic twins and a much lower association between those of dizygotic twins. So, um, so here's an example here. If we look at monozygotic versus dizygotic twins, the connections between these, the, you know, the big five personality traits, neuroticism, extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, and openness, all stronger for our monozygotic twins, which, which shows at least supports the idea that there is a genetic component. But obviously that's not the only component because even the highest one here is a 0.51, which means that it's only about half of the differences, um, half of the variability is explained by um, the, the genes. Um, or at least, you know, the combination of genes because the, some of it is also um, within dizygotic twins. So there's obviously other things going on, but there does seem to be a stronger connection when you have monozygotic twins. So that tells us that. There's also been um, adoption studies, so trying to, again, tease apart the effect of environment versus genes. Uh, several studies indicate that there's some relationship between biological parents' behavior and the behavior of their children, even when that contact has been non-existent. So that suggests potentially genetic links. There's also been a few adoption twin studies to examine twins who were separated at birth. And there's a lot of similarities between those people, including the likelihood of criminality, so that, again, points to maybe there is a genetic link there. Uh, but then we also have to remember that what's called the contagion effect, um, where if you have a genetic predisposition and, um, you know, those early experiences that make some people, including twins, susceptible to deviant behavior, that's going to be transmitted by the presence of antisocial siblings in the household or parents. Um, so you have that contagion effect as well, that that kind of ties into the situational components that can affect some of these. Although those adoption studies and the twin studies are trying to tease that out. This is an interesting one. Evolutionary theory likes to talk about um, sort of how the, the traits that are related to violence and aggression, how they've developed through the evolutionary process. And so um, 
if we look at something like um, violence, violent offenses, particularly homicide, um, are often tied to evolutionary processes. So, you know, homicide is often motivated by reproductive factors like a cheating partner or the threat of losing a mate. Um, robbery is often tied to evolution, you know, attaining resources to obtain or maintain a mate. That might not be like what's going through somebody's head, um, you know, consciously, but it might be part of what drives that behavior. Um, then when we think about, um, you know, gender based differences, um, men have evolved to be much more physical and aggressive while women evolved to be um, more nurturing and raise children. Although again, teasing out what's the social component versus the genetic component is not easy there. Although evolution can incorporate all of that, it can incorporate how we have evolved socially as well as how we have evolved genetically. So that can incorporate all of that. Um, but this is linked to the fact that the overwhelming majority of violent offenders are male. Um, and so because we look at that, men have evolved to be more physical and aggressive, that can maybe explain that difference. Um, if we look at something like uh, a specific type of violence like rape, um, this is this can be seen as a byproduct of sexual selection. So we, we reproduce to pass on our genes. That's sort of the evolutionary um, draw or pull to, to the, that type of behavior. And so men, you think about it, men prefer partner diversity while women are more selective because they have more to lose. And so, you know, even just in terms of the amount of time and effort that goes into reproduction, women have more to lose in that scenario. And so the difficulties in finding a mate then for a man may lead to coercion. So, um, you know, men want to, they have this evolutionary deep seated, not conscious need to, you know, spread their seed. Um, and if you think about the maximum offspring over the life course for women is about like, like in terms of biological maximum would be like 20. Even that is probably high. Um, there is no such limit for men. Men could have hundreds, thousands of offspring um, potentially. So because that that's sort of what makes women the gatekeepers here. And so from an evolutionary perspective, that could help explain why men are the ones that are, that are um, committing more acts of rape and violence in general. Um, but also sort of to explain uh, rape in general, which actually brings me to my next theory, which is RK theory, which is specifically a theory of reproductive selection. So this is about explaining rape and sexually assaulted behavior. And so essentially we have these two group of males. And from this perspective, all males fall into one of these categories, essentially. I mean, you can kind of fall somewhere in between, um, but typically they, they are one of these two categories. And... So the R is about quantity, K is about quality. Kind of think about it that way. So R males, um, they want more mates, as much offspring as possible, which means that they're going to have a low investment in um, any offspring that they do produce. And um, compared to the K males, which are gonna have far fewer mates, they are um, monogamous males, fewer offspring, which they then have a higher amount of investment in. Um, so R males are going to be more likely to be small and weak, uh, whereas the K males are large and strong, which is why they are going to be more successful with females compared to the R males. They're much less successful with females. Um, but what the R males have kind of evolved to do, and this is sort of, there's been research using um, um, certain primates to sort of support this idea, uh, is that they have a faster maturation. So they're not going to get as big and strong, but they get to their maximum faster to try to basically get the females before the big K males come along and take them. That's kind of, so, so the K males have a bit slower maturation because they're getting to a stronger, larger build. Um, so R males are gonna have a stronger sex drive than K males. And they're also gonna, it's gonna be associated with lower intelligence and lower experience where we see K males have a higher intelligence and higher um, experience, which helps with their success with females. So then this means that from this theory, the R males are the ones that are most likely to rape and K males are very unlikely to rape because they don't need to. Um, so this is an interesting way to think of things from an evolutionary perspective about if it's all about wanting to pass on genes, then if you can't get females any other way and you have a very high sex drive and you want ma mates and you want offspring, you know, again, not consciously, but this is your evolutionary drive then this is going to explain why certain males rape and other males don't. 
Um, also of note is that K males are far more common in the population, R males are far less common. Uh, and so that's why when we look at rape among humans, uh, it's, it's the vast minority of males that rape. 